Good to have uh, Alex Vespigliani uh, giving us a talk today. He's a renowned, well-known scholar in the very exciting field of network science that really touches many areas of society, of technology, of health. And I think he's going to be talking about that. Let me tell you a little bit about him. We're very lucky. We, we stole him from Indiana University, where he was also a distinguished professor. And so he's at Northeastern. He's a Sternberg distinguished professor with joint appointments in physics, computer science, and health sciences. Uh, uh, his appointment reflects his research, which is highly interdisciplinary. Um, he is also, uh, the, here he leads a laboratory for the modeling of biological and socio-technical systems. Uh, he has many honors to, uh, to his credit. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society and recently was uh, elected as a member of the Academy of, of Europe and, and, and many other honors. Uh, something else, if you want to learn about uh, network science uh, beyond the uh, Alex lecture, you, you can go on YouTube and there is a, a movie called uh, Six Degrees from Kevin Bacon to Network Theory, which is, uh, which is quite a fun movie that talks about uh, the research that Alex is doing, the application of network science to the spread of diseases. I don't know if some of you remember when there was the uh, flu pandemic, the, the swine flu. Uh, H1N1, and you know, we all get worried that we may catch it, and you know, it could be actually fatal, and so on. And so, um, uh, his work allowed to track actually the development of this uh, flu pandemic starting in Mexico, and you know, it was on the news, so, so even the, you know, the health organization were, were talking to him to try to get insight into, into the, the path of the disease. Um, one thing that really impressed me, uh, aside from all these scientific achievements, is that in that movie on, uh, on Six Degree. Of, of it is that they, you know, they when they when they present Alex, they actually talk as much about the science about his cooking skills. He's also a great cook, and so you know, maybe one day we can have a different kind of uh, gathering in this course. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would be pleased. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Instead of pizza. Instead of pizza. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we, 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 we can have more. 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 So it's really a pleasure to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, it was very kind, and yes, yeah, my other passion is, uh, is cooking, so one day we can, uh, we can have, you know, a uh, little talk about that. Today I will talk mostly about uh, social technical systems, what we can do in terms of, uh, of uh, predicting those, and I will go and, and, and show you the example of the H1 and 1 pandemic, so actually of, of the infectious diseases in general, and then a few other things. I will try to give you a broad perspective of what is our activity, the relation of network science with data science, uh, and uh, where are we going scientifically in the next five, uh, five to ten years. <coughs> Let me start uh, from this. Uh, you all, uh, you know, what drives uh, science? Why we, we want to do science? Why, what is the main thing? Basically, it's because we are control freaks. That's the point. You know, since we learned how to tame fire, so we were in the, in the caves, you know, then every other attempt to, to, to do science is our attempt to control nature, to predict nature, and basically to, to be risk free. This is what we want to do. And actually, this is unfortunately something that we were so successful in the past that we are used, we are spoiled. Now if you go on, uh, on any computer, you can have the weather forecast for tomorrow, for the next week, et cetera, et cetera. And don't think too much about you know, the weather forecast for your next barbecue with friends. Uh, that might be a little bit, you know, from time to time, but not very precise. But just think about weather forecast to uh, predict the pattern of hurricane of major storm. You know, these are things that save thousands of lives each year. Actually, weather forecast is what allow us to have uh, flights, you know, have airport operating, etc., etc. But then also we know that, you know, we basically now engineer airplanes within a computer and we know their performance that they will fly without we have ever built one piece of those planes. You know, people like Elan, they, they can tell you everything about new materials, what will be their properties. Again, without touching every real atom, you know, just doing the computer. Why? Because we have physics, we have chemistry, 
We have all the hard science that we developed, and we make predictions, and those predictions work. Okay. Well, predictions, of course, we have to be a little bit careful. What, what is prediction? There are predictions like, you know, the hard wild prediction. If you go on a website and you ask for the next uh, eclipse of the moon, you will have everything scheduled for the next, I think, 5,000 or 10,000 years by the, you know, the, 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 the degree of uh, what, what you will see depending on where you are, the exact time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, we cannot do prediction like that for all systems. For instance, in weather forecast, the weather, our predictions are probabilistic, okay? And actually, they are not prediction anymore. It's forecast. There is a slight difference. A forecast is uh, the best prediction that we can do given uh, our knowledge of the system that may be incomplete, okay? Or, and also, these are for forecast means also that things are going to change. So this is the best prediction at the present moment, uh, the current moment. But tomorrow that will be a little bit different. And we all know that weather forecasts are continuously updated with new data so that we can always project you know, in the time window of one week or 10 days. And then, of course, there is something else that is even more shady than, than prediction or forecast, this projection, is when there are part of the system that we do not control at all. And of course, what we do is to make assumptions and then to play the what if game, basically. You know, what if the system is like that? What if we do such a policy? What if in a social system we, we use that kind of uh, Now, all that success is pretty, uh, you know, uh, surprising. But at the same time, you know, you can start thinking about a huge amount of uh, things where actually we do not have predictive power at all. Conflicts, social uh, uh, consensus, the spreading of information, uh, uh, knowledge, uh, how science progress, uh, next diseases, uh, what I will do in case of crisis, uh, traffic, human developments, uh, all that in a moment in which each, you know, basically our flat world, our hyper-connected world is getting somehow more and more fragile. Why? Because of all those interdependencies. So, you know, an economic crisis in one place 100 years ago would not be as devastating as today. You know, now if you have a pandemic, that pandemic will reflect on the, on the airline industry that could go bankrupt, that could trigger an economic, uh, an economic crisis, and so on and so forth. Why is that? So when we lack completely, you know, the concept that we have in art science, uh, here are lacking. And why? Well, the answer is quite straightforward. We're talking about systems in which there is a huge social component. We are not talking about the weather. We are not talking about atoms. We are talking about the social atom. We are talking about you. Any infrastructure we we, we, we devise, any infrastructure we build depends and interacts because you use it. And it will change because of your use. And your behavior will change because of the infrastructure. Okay? Unfortunately, when you think about the social component, a lot of sociologists, I don't know if anyone here is in social science, no offense taken, of course, but the first answer is, well, you cannot have art science in the social arena. Okay, why? Well, because we are individuals, which are, and, and we are not atoms. So we have uh, so many uh, dimensionality in the cognitive psychological space that we cannot be predictable. Unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, this has been a big issue yet. The second issue is, well, and then there is something else. We react <coughs> to what we say. And uh, there are political leaders, uh, influencers, and so on and so forth. In Athens, you don't have something like that. Okay? However, if you go back <laughs> 100 years, and they could go back actually 300 years, but I don't want to go back so much. There are social scientists like Bloomberg and Moreno, these are very prominent social scientists, where they say, look, this is not the case. You can start thinking about a social physics. The social atom is yourself for many of the things that you do. You are not so different. Actually, 95% of the things we do, we do the same stuff. 
Okay, we more or less wake up at the same time, we more or less commute the same way, we more or less do, you know, the, the usual things. And so you start from the social atom, then you build what are, he was calling the social molecules, household, workplace, class, and then from these molecules you start to build the social, social aggregate, the society. And then if you are statistical, in a statistical sense, you can extract laws that can tell you, you know, can give you probably predictive powers. And now if you think about weather forecast, no one of us would ever challenge the ideas that I'm going to predict the motion of each molecule. I just predict the global state, you know, of the sea surface, of the atmospheric masses, etc. The same is for society. We don't want to follow you, you, or you. We want just to follow the social aggregate. Well, there is another big, big objection, however. Okay, let's imagine that this works and this program works. <coughs> what can we do? Because we don't have the data. One thing is where, when we talk about physics, uh, and we want to understand turbulent fluid, I build a, a chamber, I put a fluid, I put you know, an engine, whatever, I control the experiment. What do I do about people? You know, social science is constantly struggling with the fact that having data on 100 person is very difficult. Okay, you do questionnaire, you do things which are very, very, uh, how to say, time expensive. And now we are talking about billions of individuals. Well, you know, there have been two major revolutions in the last, uh, I would say, uh, 30 years. One uh, is the complex system science uh, uh, revolution, and the other one is the data science revolution. Complex system science is basically the science of aggregates, of systems, with a lot of uh, individuals that interact through simple rules. And complex system science has shown that even if you have very simple rules among the individuals, you can create enormously complicated macroscopic behavior. Basically, if you think about, uh, uh, you know, when you're a boy, you are always told about, you know, well, there is the ant uh, nest, and then there is the ant uh, soldier. There are the soldiers, the workers. There is the queen, etc., etc. No, why? Because we are our anthropocentric perspective tells that uh, we need a hierarchy. We need somebody who thinks and give uh, instruction, the leader. Well, you know, complex system science. Uh, one of the success is to show that is not that the case. The ant queen is the most stupid of them all. Basically, just deposit eggs. Uh, you know, and all the others do not have specialization. They just interact with true simple, fer few simple pheromonic signals, and they are able to build uh, these beautiful things. Just one piece of information. I don't know if you know anything about termites. Termites uh, in uh, in certain areas they build the termites nest, which are a few meters tall, so very big things that then goes underground. Those systems, if you don't have a kind of right conditioning system, then you cannot have the nest. And this is just because, you know, the difference in temperature, except, well, termites invented the geothermal convection, so they have basically air conditioning in those, in those nests. Now you can imagine, they do not have engineers, they do not know anything about geothermal things, this is just self-organization. So you don't need, you know, complex system science is telling you that we can get questions very radically the idea of leadership, you know, political guidance, etc., etc. Many of the things that we see in society are not because we have a leader or somebody who tells us what to do, but actually it's the contrary. We create those leaders because the society needs them. Okay. The second part is data science. So for years we could not do anything in social sciences because we didn't have data. Now we are in the data science here. You have your mobile phone. Your mobile phone is telling me exactly where you are, who you are talking with, and everything is registered and taking track, taking care of uh, how to say. Since they have to be you, they have to record of that interaction. And you know, I can harvest those data for millions of individuals and get a co complete map of your physical mobility as well as your social reaction uh, relations over the phone. 
But then, you know, we have proximity sensor all over the places. We have uh, all the infinite amount of uh, social networks that we exploit every day on the web. We have Twitter that, you know, where you basically, you, you, you plug your daily conversation. All those data for billions of individuals, and we can mine and harvest those data. I can just want, I, I just want to give you a few examples. This is uh, RFID tags. So these are small, not uh, intrusive tags that register face-to-face -face interaction. That was a conference in a room, and then you see that now people are talking and moving to the bar and the cafeteria. You can track their interactions. Okay, the width of the lines uh, is how much they are talking, basically face-to-face. You see that the things are a little bit displaced. There is people that seem to talk a lot, but they are a little bit far. That's because for privacy reasons, we cannot map where the people are. You know, because unfortunately, as soon as you do those kind of experiments, you enter issues with privacy and you know, all the ethical considerations. But you see, basically, what you can do with this RFID tag that costs less than $10 is to keep track of face-to-face -face interaction you know, exactly. And we have deployed experiments with thousands of people. Okay. And of course, you can know, but you, you can imagine how many interesting things we did in hospital to understand how, you know, is the relation between patients, uh, nurses, doctors, uh, uh, people visiting. You can do in schools, you can do in classes, you can do in conferences. Well, we can move up what I call the mesoscopic level. This is uh, the night of the music in Paris. And those traces are from mobile phone of people that are going from one place to another. This is the night of music, so there are a lot of concerts in each of those places. And so you can track where people go. And the idea was to understand what was the best concert, how to optimize traffic for the next year, etc., etc. You see those nice uh, fireworks? This is people that get into the subway. The cell signal is lost, and they <laughs> pop up at another subway stop. And so the way to visualize it is that you teleport it. The people from one place to another. Well, you have a complete city, basically, here. You know. This is at the mesoscopic level. Then at the global level, you get things like that. This is the complete airline uh, uh, traffic in the United States. You see first the East Coast that wakes up, the center states, then the West Coast, uh, last uh, Hawaii. Then you see the wave of planes coming from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from Europe, intercontinental flights. Well, we have those data for the entire world, with six months anticipation, because this has to be organized pretty well in advance, basically. So we have the schedule of all the flights, uh, which tarmac the, the airplane will, uh, will, uh, will fly, what kind of carrier, what kind of plane, how many seats, you know, all those data. And this is the global mobility. This is even, uh, you know, uh, this is not, you don't see very well, but this is basically something that happened on Twitter. This is uh, basically intercepting Twitter messages, and this is the 15th of May in Spain, where a big protest has been triggered during the night. You see that at a certain point in Madrid, uh, there is an explosion of communication because there is a big street protest, and that uh, it will stick basically for one week. You will see that basically you can monitor the conversation between the people you know, on a real time, and this is more than 100,000 people that are messaging each other uh, on, on, in, uh, in that country. You know, you can do that uh, infinitely, you know, you can get the, the huge information from those social microblogging because you can also read what people are telling about, okay, what is the, the conversation. This is a project uh, by Yamil Moreno and uh, Alex Arenas. This is people in uh, Zaragoza and, uh, and Barcelona, Spain, we are collaborating with. Well, we can go even more deeper into other things. This is uh, political donations uh, from the Republican and Democratic side in New York. <laughs> this is a map made by David Laser uh, Lab, uh, and, and, uh, and you know, you see basically that we cannot just map what we do, where we go, etc., but also what we think. We can map, you know, what area of a city are more democratic or Republican. What you, so you can imagine to start cross-correlating all those data. Your credit card data, your preferences, etc., etc. So the point is this one. So that we are entering a new area, a new era, in which we can really do different things with social, with the social aggregate. We can measure it. It's like having the tomography of the society. Okay? Well, of course, uh, the tomography of the society is not enough. Because this doesn't allow to get, uh, you know, 
the tomography is just a zoology, okay? You can see what, what's happening, but you don't have, uh, how to say, the, uh, you want to make predictions, then you need models. You, you need understanding. You need uh, physical laws, okay? And unfortunately, of course, those systems are very complex. Why? Because there is a large number of heterogeneous individuals. We have a lot of time on landscapes. If you talk for 30 seconds, two minutes, but then you travel for 15 days to another place, you know. Uh, we have all the nonlinearity, etc., etc. So basically, we are, are challenging the prototypical complex systems, where complexity is not complication, but is complexity. And why is not complication but complexity? Because in such complex systems, linear thinking do not does not apply. What is linear thinking? Do you know what is linear thinking? You learn when you are four years old even three years if you are smart enough. Basically, the linear thinking is that to a small perturbation corresponds a small perturbation. To a large perturbation, it corresponds a large response of the system. You learn that because you want to know that if you jump from a two-story building, you will kill yourself, OK? Because you want to understand that if somebody is eating you, you know, slowly, it's just because he wants to caress you. If uh, he's eating you fast, he wants to harm you. You know, you learn that again. And then actually, all that we do in science is also linearization. So this is what we do generally. <laughs> you know, we are very good at linearized problem. Okay? Unfortunately, in complex systems, linearization is usually the wrong way. So in most of the complex systems, small perturbation can lead to large response of the system, avalanches, uh, epidemics, etc., etc. I will show you the example. And in many cases, a large perturbation can just be absorbed that by the system because it adapts. Okay, so basically complex systems are very counterintuitive. And this is create an issue. How we can have models and try to get rational for the behavior of the models. How can we explore those models? It's, this is where the computers comes. This is where the computational thinking comes in. Why? Because now the computer becomes the way to really analyze those systems. We recreate the system in the computer, simulate the system in the computer, and try to understand everything that is non-intuitive, all the non-linearities of the system. And then we can try, perhaps, to focus around the non-linear point of interest and try there to linearize or to have a theory that is just adapted to that point. So the computer is not anymore a number crunching machine. The computer is a tool like calculus. Okay, it becomes your laboratory. It's where you recreate the world and you perform the experiment. And it has been defined actually by a, several years ago by a French scientist that now the name says I, I, I blank out, I'm sorry as the microscope. Why? Because with the microscope, we were able to understand the microscopic behavior of system, to look at a single cell, a single atom. Now the computer is doing the opposite. It's giving us an understanding of the microscopic behavior of the system. It builds up the system from the single piece and look at the entire, at the entire systemic perspective. And so we can do that and use this global perspective to finally say, OK, we have the data, we have the model, we have the computational thinking, we integrate all together. Now let's start predicting you know, social technical system behavior. And now I want to give you the example. We did start, uh, well, this is you know, computational thinking if you don't know what it is, because actually computational thinking there is, is a buzzword in a sense. Now there is a lot about computational thinking. Computational thinking is the fact that you have to think uh, for the, com the problem in a way that you can solve in the computer. So you, you need to think more in terms of algorithms, you need to more, more in terms of machine learning, you need more to, to, to think more in terms of, really of what you can do with the computer to understand the system. Okay? Well, I will start to talk about epidemics because this is somehow a simple example. So what we do is to construct this <laughs> structure that basically maps uh, the social system. First, you know, the population, where we live, okay? Then what we, how we move, because we are the care of the cities, okay? And so we need to map all the mobility of people, airlines, commuting patterns, etc. 
And then on, on top of that, there is an epidemic model. So how we single individual develop a disease and transmit to the other people. And this could be very complicated, complicated models that come from epidemiology. Well, all that we do is to create, you know, put one layer on top of each other, and then create simulations that once I get the initial condition of a certain epidemic outbreak, the disease, then I can start projecting what will happen to the disease and, uh, and provide information to the policy makers on what will happen during the course of the disease. Okay? Uh, well, as you let me give you just uh, two more, uh, uh, a little bit of details. So, the population layer, what we do is to take data that now comes from large scale experiments, like uh, one made at the National. Uh, uh, space agency, another one is in Colombia. Basically, we know the population with the resolution of uh, one kilometer, uh, basically less than one mile per one mile. So if we cover the surface of the Earth by those little grids, and we know how many people live in each of these places. Okay, uh, this is worldwide. Then we have, uh, you know, the large scale uh, mobility that is not a problem. You go to the International Aviation Association and you ask them. Uh, to give uh, the data of the all islands in the world. That unfortunately is not easy. It costs a lot of money because they do for commercial reasons. So you pay you know, a lot of money, but you have all those data. And then you know, there is another part. This is the community part. This is the toughest part. So how we go to work, how we drop kids to school, etc., etc. This is uh, available for a handful of uh, uh, of, ca of countries, about 50 countries. So, for instance, you have, we have a very good mapping in North America, in, in North South America, very good mapping in Europe, uh, but Australia. But in other places, you can imagine, you are in Mongolia, you know, or places like that, you don't have a lot of commuting data. And so, of course, you have to interpolate, and there is all techniques that have been there <coughs> to, to, get, uh, to get these micro-mobility uh, patterns. And then there is the epidemic model. This, for instance, would be a very simple model which that <coughs> individuals first are susceptible. They can become latent if they are in contact with some infectious individuals. After a certain number of days, you become fully infectious, and you can be symptomatic. So you have fever, you stay home, or you can be even asymptomatic for certain diseases, but anyway spread uh, the, vi the virus or the bacteria, and this is the worst uh, Typology of things because, of course, you cannot track those people. And then there is people that could travel more because of the disease or less, etc. And then after a certain time, you recover. This is a kind of gray area because, in some cases, you, for certain diseases, you are dead, for certain diseases, you have just recovered, for certain diseases, you have permanent immunization or not, depending on what you're talking about. However, this is a simplified model. Actually, when you do things for real, you have to use much, much more complicated models that comes from epidemiology that fits specific disease you want to, <coughs> to simulate. Well, if you have to do that, there is also a lot of other disciplines involved. There is epidemiology, there is uh, physics, and I cannot tell you why, but actually the techniques that you simulate, we simulate uh, seven discrete figures in the videos. That means that we have to use approximations that are using atomic physics. Uh, to separate, for instance, uh, time scales. Uh, no, probably you are not expert, but just to give you the name, it's called the born oppenheimer approximation. Basically, you do the same, you know. And then, uh, as well, you have computer science, because you have to create an infrastructure that runs on a supercomputer. You have designer, because you need to exploit the data.